Welcome, Leslie. How are you doing? It's good to see you. Training camp's kind of a grind, but it's hard to imagine a year more different than this one. Oh, man. Oh, man. We've never seen a year like this, Steve, when it comes to training camp. Uh, but our guys have been working through it, and uh, they've been doing a really good job. So, I get, you know, the, your defense was really good last year. Congratulations on that. I know you have even plans to be even better this year. Most times when teams have some chair, players change over, like you brought in Mario Addison and Vernon Butler and Quentin Jefferson. Uh, you got A.J. Epinesa there. Is it – did they did they cause you – does it cause you concern, or do those guys give you comfort? <laughs> Is it – you know what I'm saying? Is it yeah. great to bring guys like those in, or are you still concerned about having some moving parts? Well, you always want talented players, for sure. I mean, you never turn down – Good football players, and you're, you're right. Mario, I mean, he's an excellent player. The guy with 40 sacks in our league, and, right. and you've got the guy like AJ, who we have high hopes for. Uh, you get an AJ Klein who's contributed in our league. Uh, we brought in some veteran guys. Uh, Quentin Jefferson from Seattle comes from a lineage where they've had a lot of success uh, as a team. So uh, you always want good players, and you know we've been trying to bring them together knowing the fact that we haven't had an off season other than Zoom. Uh, so we've used this training camp to try to build the chemistry that's necessary to succeed on, on defense as well as as a team. What have you known? I know that we all realize that it's been like impossible for these rookies to have a normal rookie season. And it's always hard for those guys to acclimate. Has there been something, either problems or, or bonuses that have come from COVID with these, is there going to be something about these rookies when they come into the league, that's going to make them get off to a better start or a worse start or a more apprehensive start? Is it? How's it going to be different for these rookies given this weird offseason? The thing that sticks out, Steve, and I saw it when we began to speed up the tempo of practices, is trying to catch up with the speed of the game. You know, when you miss an entire offseason, that's one step that you, the one piece you miss coming from college. You don't realize how big and fast these guys are at our level. And you see right. it in the preseason. All of a sudden, you say in the preseason, wow, these guys are really moving. But then when the game, when the regular season starts, there's another level. And so for the young guys, uh, the rookies, they're missing that. And uh, that's going to be a challenge for them, for sure. It was a challenge for AJ early on uh, to get acclimated. For Dane Jackson, another draft pick on defense, uh, for those guys to get acclimated to the speed of the game. And the same thing will happen once we start the season. You know, it's – it's so strange, this, this, the COVID pandemic and the way it's had to change the way everybody does business. Um, I just got to ask you now, it, you know, I know that uh, Sean told us that like every opening day, there's a little apprehension. You know, you, you hope your guys show up good. You hope they show up energized and ready to go. You try to prepare them. But the apprehension comes and what the other guy's going to do. Yeah. 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 I mean. You don't even, I was making a joke today. You don't even know what the Jet uniforms are going to look like, let alone who's going to play in them, right? There has never been a bigger unknown opening day on both sidelines than 2020. No doubt about it. I mean, no doubt about it. it's funny you say that. I was meeting with our advanced scout earlier today. He was asking me, you know, what do you want me to put together to talk about with the coaching staff? And it's so unusual because you don't have any preseason games. You don't have any off season to, to really talk about. So you represent really just personnel acquisitions that they've made in the off season. And you're just talking in general terms. There's nothing you can really be specific about. So you're right. It's just so different than anything we've ever experienced, uh, but it's different for both teams. And you really have to kind of let your rules kind of take over. You, there are so many unknowns. And as you're trying to measure, are you ready for the regular season? Usually, you know, during the preseason, you had some games and some staffs. You get a feel for where you are, how far you have to go to get to the where you need to be for game day. But you don't have that measure to stick this time around. So there's going to be some. There's going to be a learning curve on, on, on game one, unlike any other. Well, I know that the you know the evaluation of these guys. I mean, you got these young guys, and you got a lot of guys that most of us don't know, haven't heard of. They're your rookie free agents, or even the draft picks. You know, most people, uh, uh, unlike any other year most people couldn't pick these guys out of a lineup because they don't see them on TV all the time. You know, they're not out there. The, the media is not covering it with a big splash. So, you know, is there, um, how has that evaluated? And I know the evaluation is different because you don't have games to put these guys in, but how's it changed the way you make decisions? Well, it's changed a lot. 
you, you would love to see them in the heat of the moment in a, in a game situation to handle certain situations and see how they would handle certain situations. But now you don't have it. So we've tried to simulate some of those situations in practice, uh, but we're going against our offense all the time. So for players, they get a little bit accustomed to one another. And so it's not the truest way to evaluate guys, but it is what it is. I mean, this, is this is the situation that we have. And so it's difficult for young rookies to make that splash in a game situation. Because you and I have seen guys who have made the roster because of things they did in preseason games, and whether it be special teams or coming in late and really performing well in the preseason. Well, you don't have that now. Uh, so guys, you're trying to evaluate them based off of practice. And there are probably going to be some good football players being released for sure. Right. And how do you, and I know this too, you're going from 78, 79, where the Bills stand right now, all the way down to 53. And then you kind of sort through the rubble and try and decide which guys you got to have back. Uh, certainly, um, you are going to have to, at least for a minute, say goodbye to some guys you really don't want to say goodbye to. How much gamesmanship at the end of your roster cuts or at the beginning of your roster cuts do you say, okay, nobody knows about this guy, so they're not going to pick him up, but they may know about him, so we'll keep him even though this is the guy over here we really want, and we can keep them both. That kind of thing because of the practice squad and that kind of thing is that you got to put some thought into that, right? Absolutely. That's where it comes from. Some of the parts of the conversation we've had, you know, with our general manager, Brandon Bean, just about what you just said, you know, who are the guys that other teams have some information on that they might try to claim and, and who can we maybe slip through and protect? So if we find ourselves in a situation that we have to pull in a practice wall, we'll get the best quality. So, you know, the fact that there are no preseason games uh, with tapes, maybe that might help you with some of those guys, but uh, there is a little bit of games, gamesmanship going on with that. And you just hate to lose a guy that you were counting on to be on your practice squad if something were to happen and you invested all of this time over this training camp and now he gets stashed away by another team and you got to bring in a guy from the outside under these conditions, it's it would be a challenge. So we'll see how it all play, plays out. Yeah, the last thing you want to do, really, particularly given the abbreviated offseason and the no game, you don't want to start, you, you may have to start from scratch with more than a handful of players on your practice squad and trying to get them acclimated the way you've done it the last 48 days of training camp, correct? I mean, you may have, you may meet somebody for the first time and they, by the end of the season or even mid season, you may be game planning to get them in the game. Yeah, I mean, that, that could be the case, especially with COVID and you don't know how it's going to hit your team. So, you know, we've gone through all those different scenarios and we've got our fingers crossed hoping that we can keep the bulk of the guys that we put on the practice squad. As you know, Steve, they've increased it this year to where you can have 16 guys available. So. You like to keep the bulk of those guys with you. you. You've invested a lot of time in those players going back to the April, May Zoom calls all the way through what we've done in training camp. So you'd like to be able to hold on to them. Yeah, you're you're kind of lucky. This team, the Bills, where you've got a ton of guys back from last year, a ton of guys who know how you coach. They know the language that you're speaking in your defensive system. They know the – if if not – Everybody on the defense, they know the basics of what they're doing. They've got a full year in it. you got a lot of continuity. How enormously beneficial is that going to be when you kick it off in, in a couple of weeks? I think it's been a, a huge advantage. I hope, you know, you really don't know until you get on the field on game day. But I, I sense that continuity has really helped us this offseason. Uh, you know, we could probably get out and play tomorrow because of the continuity we have on our defense for sure. Speak the same language. We've got a number of guys that have been with us for the last two or three years, so that helps a lot. Uh, the, probably the biggest challenge for us, uh, just finding the, the leaders from within. You know, losing Kyle Williams the year before Lorenzo Alexander stepped in that role. Steve did a terrific job for us. So you're looking and saying, okay, who's going to be our leader on the field? And you expect Tremaine to continue to grow as a player and, a, and, a, and as a person in that role. Uh, will Matt Milano step up? Tour as a leader will one of our defensive linemen will it be Jerry Hughes step in and fill those shoes. So you know, we're going through it and just trying to find out who's going to be that leader for us on the field to replace a guy like Lorenzo. Tell people who are listening, can you put quantify somehow or explain how important it is for an NFL coaching staff to first and foremost know your own guys before you even know the, you know, what you know, what you can do, what you can't do, you know, how important it is and how long does it take? And 
And how much did you not know, even with all the continuity, how much did you not know about your own guys this year coming into training camp? Yeah, you know, uh, that's a great point you're making because before you can really install defense or really feel comfortable about calling certain defenses, you need to know your personnel. You need to know kind of what you know, causes those guys to tick, what gets them excited, uh, what causes them to pull back a little bit as well. So you, you want to learn their personality. Fortunately for us, we've been around one another for quite a few years uh, with the majority of our veteran players, uh, other than the guys that are coming from other teams. So that continuity and that familiarity you know, really helps us. Uh, and my understanding, you know, what buttons to kind of push with a Michael Hyde or a Jordan Poirier or Tremaine or Matt or some of those guys. But the unknown that was presented by not having an off season, not being around each other, uh, to come back in this environment, which is an unusual environment, because ordinarily, you know, we'd be in, up at St. John's Fisher for training camp and training in that environment when, when things were so different. I mean, there were so many unknowns coming into, the, into this training camp about the mental, not the physical, but the mental, how would guys adjust to these protocols how would they be able to really centralize their thinking and concentrate on football with all the stuff that's going on outside of the building? So uh, it's been a learning curve in that way because you do have to address that part of it. You can't ignore it. I mean, it's real life. Uh, there's a, a fear by some uh, and, and the unknown about the daily testing and so on. So you have to work through some of that. And I think our guys have done a great job with it. Our staff has done a terrific job of getting things in place and getting our players acclimated to the point where they can focus on football when they're in the building. But that, as much as anything, Steve, threw the curve ball into what we were doing, just the different protocols, even just to get into the building. Well, you're right. And you do have a lot of different players on your defense, some key guys, certainly guys on the defensive front that are going to be rotated in, the veteran guys you mentioned, like uh, Mario Addison, Vernon Butler, uh, yeah. Quentin Jefferson, along with, you know, A.J. Epinesa and the rest, Ed Oliver coming back for his second year. you got a lot of guys out there that are coming back. And But with the continuity you do have, with the guy, the secondary that you've got, the talent and the depth that it seems that you've got, you had a really good year last year defensively. How much do you want to change all that, right? Or, or is there another level you want to take these guys to? Are there more things you want to throw in that you maybe can do this year? I mean, I know everything evolves year to year. I mean, the offense is going to change a little bit this year. They'll have a little extra stuff going on there because of their different talent. What does what do the new players that we're talking about in your defense and one more year in this system, how does that like free you up or give you more options as a defensive coordinator? Yeah, the, the, the one thing I talk to our guys about, and you know this as well as I do, that every year is different in our league and obviously this year is far different. But you can't rest on your laurels. I've had so many people that have come up to me or call me saying, hey, I've been studying you guys' defense, man. You guys are really good at this, really good at that. I mean, league-wide, people have been studying us and trying to come up with ways to defeat some of the things that we do. And But for us, it's been about going back to the fundamentals of what we do because you miss so much time in the spring as well as the summer. Uh, but just getting good at the fundamentals. If we can be good at that and be good teachers of that, then we go out and we can execute what we do and we'll you know, have a few wrinkles here and there, but we can't get away from what we've been really good at. Uh, but the key for us will be integrating and got the new guys into what we do and being able to maximize their abilities, their strengths. And if we can do that along with guys like Tremaine and some of our guys that are returning, if they can take their game up to another level, Ed Oliver, and integrate the new guys, well, yeah, we'll, we'll take that next step, even though people are studying us and trying to figure out you know, ways to handle our defense, the key is us, you know, our being able to know ourselves and well enough to succeed. Is that kind of the mentality you're going to take into opening day? We, we spoke earlier, you know, about this, the huge unknown. I mean, the Jets won't know you guys any more than you're going to know the Jets. It's as though both of you just started the whole team from the ground up, but between seasons. So does that, your mindset as a coaching staff, does that put you on full attack mode as a defense? Let's see if they can handle all of this stuff. Let's put them on the heels. Or is it more of a, let's just be disciplined, sit back, and we'll see what they've got, and then we'll pick our spots. I mean, what what kind of, or, you know, or do you just sit back thinking they're going to be the attackers? we got to have, you know, they may come with the trick plays and the funky formations and the 
different personnel combinations. You know what I mean? Um, do you attack them or do you wait for them to try to you know blow out their trick bag? Yeah, I think for us, it's even from our being able to execute and be fundamentally sound on, on, on defense. And the schematics of it, uh, it'll all be about how well we execute what we do. Because no matter really what our call, what we call on defense, can we execute it at a high level on game day? That's the key. And so we've been spending a lot of time on fundamentals uh, and, and technique and making sure we're sound in those areas. And we feel like if we can out execute the opponent that gives us the best chance to succeed. The schematic is part of it. You have to be careful about not out scheming yourself, you know, in some ways. How how much different is this defensive front gonna look with all the new faces? And what are they are they gonna be? I mean, what's their if last year had a personality, what was it and what's how is it different from this year's personality? Yeah, you know, we were such a, a in your in your face uh, type of defense in so many ways with the but our, we have, we have, one of our tackles was almost a double-digit guy, Jordan Phillips. I mean, he was right on the border in the, that area. Uh, Shaq Lawson did a terrific job for us. Uh, but having a, a Mario, having a, a Vernon Butler, uh, a, Quirin, a, a, a Quinn Jefferson, I mean, they're the same type of players who are going to give us that same energy up front. So we expect to have a dominant front, and that really is where it starts for us on defense. So those guys are bringing great energy and great skill as well. So we're looking forward to watching them play uh, on September 13th and going out and just wrecking havoc. But that's that will be the best description of us being aggressive, you know, in your face, uh, just a downhill defense. And I think we can continue that. One of the one of the things about this off season has been that you've been called upon to be more than a football coach. Uh, George Floyd, uh, Jacob Blake. Uh, the social unrest across the country and, and how, you know, the NFL seems to be in the middle of every major event in the country because people want to see what these great athletes have to say about it or good or bad, uh, positive and negative. Uh, and of course the league is, it, it takes its share of criticism be, because of it. How difficult or, well, A, how difficult, B, how important as it is and and see how's it going with everything going on with the with society outside the, the lines of the football field and and how and the effect that the nfl can have on it yeah obviously i'll be, be lying and say it has been a challenge i mean it uh you know for a lot of our players i don't know if i want to share this with you but on wednesday of last week we had a, a town hall type meeting with it and our players different guys stood up and shared some of their stories of dealing with uh, societal injustice. And it was, uh, it was gut wrenching, man, uh, to hear some of the stories of some of our players. And it wasn't just one race. It was just an entire group of guys. And um, it really, I think, galvanized our players and, and, and I believe, you know, helped bring them closer together to hear one another's stories, uh, both Caucasian guys and our, uh, black guys as well, just talking about their, their different situations they face. So, you know, you, you, you mentioned it as a coach, you probably weren't thinking that you'd be involved in a pandemic along with having to deal with the social justice issues uh, as a group, but that's, that's where we are in today's society. And so uh, credit to Sean and our ownership for allowing our players to use their platform to affect change. And that's what the league wants to see happen. I mean, they're really you know, pushing our players to speak out and speak up and, and, and be a part of the positive change that we want to see in our society, which I think is fantastic and, uh, and is, is encouraged. And, and our guys are, are, are taking hold of that. And yet they've got to bring it back in and get focused on football and go out and perform at a high level without ignoring you know, what's going on in our country as well. But uh, it has definitely been a challenge in some ways, but it also provides a great opportunity for athletes to provide a voice uh, to some injustices. Now you, because the, the league is, and because of training camp, you know, the media can't really talk about what's going on. It's not open to the public. It's behind closed doors, all the practices, the scrimmages, all that nobody really gets to see. And there's no open interviews of players. Now tell us out on the outside of that bubble, of uh, that quasi bubble, 
are you happy with how the league has been handling all of this? I know that's something the league's not really wasn't really set up to do. Maybe they're getting better now, but you know it's a sports league, and all of a sudden it's kind of set itself up as trying to be a leader in a really difficult topic around our country. How do you think they're doing, and and do you expect them to be better or worse? You know, give us a, your synopsis of how the entire league is handling from the leadership on down. Yeah, you know, our game must be the most popular game. And- United States and maybe even in the world in some, in some ways. And so we have a tremendous influence the NFL does. And I think the league is doing their best to uh, take a hold of, of, of this situation and be out in front uh, and doing the very best that they can to have a voice, a positive voice in trying to affect change. And which is one of the reasons they've encouraged teams to allow their players to be independent and and really come together and, and be as one. And so uh, I appreciate what the commissioner as well as our, uh, what our ownership is doing and really supporting our players uh, and having a voice and not just saying, you know, shut up and play football, but allowing our players to have a voice because there are a lot of people in our country who look up to these professional athletes and uh, if they can use their platform to make our world better appreciate the league encouraging that. I appreciate the producers encouraging that as well. Yeah, and I, and I, I do too. And I, it's been uh, it's been fun to watch this team develop under Sean and you and and Dayball and and the group and with with Brandon being the new players that you've acclimated. It really seems like um, even from the players who have played here in Buffalo in the last handful of years under you and Sean and uh, Brandon being and the whole crew. Even when they leave, guys like Jordan Phillips, guys like Shaq Lawson, guys, um, EJ Gaines, when he was here before before he was injured, and guys who have come here and left have said wonderful things about the great experience it's been here to play in Western Europe, not just for the city of Buffalo and the fans, but for the organization. That's, that's got to give you and Sean and Brian Dayball, Brandon Bean, and the entire staff a real sense of satisfaction that e- – Winning games are, I mean, we're here to win games, but winning games are not, you're doing something right. Yeah. Well, I mean, Sean said it all the time. I mean, it's, we think, we think we can do both, Steve, you know, have success on the field and yet produce a product that makes Western New York very proud of their team and the community uh, you know, outside of uh, this building. And, you know, it, it starts with our leadership for sure trickles down to our players and it's it's a great place to work it's a great place to play if you're a player uh, but the demands to win I mean they're high it's intense but I think you can we all think we, we can do both we can, we can be good citizens and, and, and really make a difference in our world and still win in football as well and that's that we want to be that example for others well, listen, we got uh, this is a, a you know a podcast between you and me, but there's going to be a bunch of season ticket holders watching. So we asked them if they want to send in some questions. So we're not going to we're going to we're not going to split the atom here, but we do have some questions that are kind of fun. And this one, <laughs> this one is uh, this is from uh, from Tim Thompson in North Tonawanda. He says, as a coach, which is more which is better to coach, a rookie or a veteran? Then he follows this up as a defensive coordinator. What gives you more, more, uh, gives you a bigger smile, a sack or, a, or an interception? So what is it, rookie or veteran, and then a sack or an interception? Well, if that rookie is Tredavis White, you, know, you probably really enjoy coaching a, a young Tredavis White. Um, but I, probably probably the, the veteran because uh, you know, he kind of knows what to expect with the league and uh, the learning curve is not so steep. Uh, probably with the veteran player, a lot of it has to do who that veteran player is, but that would probably be the way to go just because of the, the gap you've got to close coming from college to the NFL. It's, uh, it's a wide gap, and, and even more so this year with what has happened with the offseason. Uh, and the second question again was what I Sack and interception. Or sack. Um, boy, I did play defensive back. But the D line was. <laughs> all over me if I say an interception. So I better say sack. I'm always talking about sack strip fumble. You know? So I'm going to say sack strip fumble. Yeah, sack strip fumble. Yeah. Yeah. Is now in the NFL more important than pressure? 
and I'm going to put it to you, which is, is it pressure or is it coverage? I know it's got to be balanced, but still. Yeah, you, you, you definitely want to be able to do both. But if you can rush with four, Steve, and cover with seven, I'll take that for sure. Uh, but it's so hard to find four really, really good So you end up having to bring pressure from time to time, but ideally, you can rush some of these great quarterbacks with four and get pressure on them and still be able to with wide outs with some extra guys. That, that's how you want to do it. Yeah, I would agree. In fact, they've I've, I've made this case back in 2000, when the Seahawks won their Super Bowl, they maybe played one of the great defensive games of in the Super Bowl in Super Bowl history. I mean, there may have been better defenses in the Super Bowl, but they faced maybe the best offense we've ever seen with Peyton Manning and 50 plus touchdowns and and all the guys they had. And yet the Seattle Seahawks defense crushed them with the ability to rush Peyton Manning and get quick pressure with just four guys. And that was really the difference in the game. And that seems to be kind of the holy grail that other teams are kind of searching for now to do that with just four guys. Yeah, I mean, that's every defensive coordinator, that's what they would want to see happen. It's just so hard to find those type of pass rushes. So you end up having to add a guy with these great quarterbacks. Sometimes, man, they'll look at their chops when you add a guy to the, to the rush uh, and you create those one on ones with some of these exceptional wideouts. So, you know, that's why, that's why it's such a premium, Steve, on defensive linemen that can rush the pass going to always be uh, a, a, one of the highest paid players on your defense, a guy that can rush and affect the game uh, because of the pressure he puts on the quarterback without you having to bring extra people. All right, I got another question from uh, Jim Benner from Wheatfield. He says, this would be his family's 56th consecutive year with season tickets to the Bills games. Uh, he says, now as a former player, he's asking you and a great coach, how do you feel about empty stands affecting the player with no fans in the stands? How's it going to affect their motivation and performance during the game? I think they'll still be mo motivated to go out and play. I mean, you know, some of the obvious reasons, but I, tell you, I thought about this a lot. We, we had a practice about a week ago, a few days ago in the stadium uh, with these simulated crowd noise. And I was just trying to get a feel for what it would be like. And what you miss is, you know, when you make that big play at home on defense and the crowd really gets into it, man, you feed off of that energy as a player and a coach and it energizes you. So you, you know, you're going to miss that. You got to find that motivation in a, a different way. Uh, and those ebbs and flows sometimes that, that come in a game where the crowd gets so loud at home, you start getting some false starts by the offense. Uh, they're not functioning as, as well, not communicating as well through the headsets. So you're going to lose some of that. Uh, and that's that's what I think you'll, you'll lose as much as anything. The guys still be motivated. They'll still want to go out and play. But the, the emotional highs and, and sometimes lows for the opponent, uh, you're going to miss that with the crowd, but not with the crowd not being here. I got one more thing. I, you, um, 35 years ago, this is another question from a, a fan. This is Eric Allen from Lockport. He says, 35 years ago, you remember maybe the greatest – defense in the history of the NFL, you know, 85 Bears. I was at, listen, I was in college in 1985 at Northwestern in Chicago. I remember those things, right? So, so you remember that. What, in that time, since 85, what's been the most significant change in the NFL? Maybe on defense, you can talk about your side of the football, and then maybe in general. What are the two biggest differences, both on the field defensively, that have happened since 1985, and now maybe at large, how about the NFL has changed in 35 years? Yeah, probably you know, when I look back at it, the evolution of the passing game, you know, when I was playing, the 49ers and the Chargers were teams that were really throwing it a lot, uh, but there were a lot of teams that still had a fullback in the game and were running the football and trying to stay balanced, whereas today, man, got to find a way, like we were just talking about a moment ago, to rush the passer, but they're spreading you out and trying to find mismatches every Sunday. It's all about, you know, being able to, to find a mismatch. And it's just a few teams in our league that will still try to be balanced, uh, run pass. And the majority put so much into the quarterback position today, as well as the raw receivers in that left tackle position. It's just a, 
a different game in that way, how much they spread you out and really try to you know, win the game throwing the ball. And uh, other than that, you know, the, the financial rewards for the player today versus back then, but the, in the game itself, it's the evolution of the passing game, and the, the points, uh, and how liberal the officiating has become in the passing game. You know, we could be a lot more physical with receivers when I played than you can today. Some of the hits that we would put on a receiver back then, it, you're going to get a letter in the mail from the commissioner. It's going to be, you know, cost you some money. Right. It's a game in that respect as well. All right, last question. I'll give you a quick list, and you tell me the, what you think about this list. Uh, a, no off-season training, a completely different training camp, COVID-19, social unrest throughout the country and no fans in the stands. What's the biggest challenge for the Buffalo Bills this year? I would like for most teams adjusting to the no off season and how you had to construct your training camp. Still a lot of unknowns as to if the way you did it, it, was it the right way to prepare for the season? Because every team did it differently. You know, the, the league gave us some guidelines when we came to training camp, but you could kind of shape things the way you wanted, your walkthroughs, your jog-throughs, your full-speed practices. Did you do enough to get your players in shape to go play a game for four quarters? Did you lose guys to injuries uh, in training camp when you're just practicing against yourself? Were you able to navigate these waters uh, when it comes to the COVID protocol along with the social unrest around our country? Were you able to keep the unity on your team without it becoming divisive? So uh, just dealing with that part of it, just the, the, the not having an off season and trying to put it together to prepare yourself for the season has probably been the big, biggest challenge uh, trying to orchestrate that. Leslie, it's been great talking to you. I know walking around the big, we don't get to pass each other in the hall, say hi, let nothing. So, hey, it's good to see you guys look great. I know you're looking forward to the season. Best of luck, and uh, thanks so much for spending some time with us tonight. It's great to see you. Good luck. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me. Take care now. All right.